Okay, so we are going to get started. Um, welcome, everyone. I uh, am very excited for this presentation today and for our speaker. My name is Dr. Cassie Desena Jacobs. I'm a full-time faculty member here at the School of Social Work. This is our fifth continuing ed series for the SMI series. Today, we're going to talk about children, adolescents, and serious mental illness. Our speaker today is uh, Tara Pappas. Tara is an LCSW. Tara works um, for a local Richmond nonprofit and is an adjunct here at the School of Social Work and has a plethora of experience working with SMI and children and adolescents. So I'm really excited for this series today and this lecture. So Tara has asked that we um, hold the questions for the end. So if you put them in the chat, we'll be able to, to get to those at the end because it is really hard when people are presenting to see the, the questions. So please just put them right in the chat. And I'm gonna turn it over to Tara. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for joining me. Um, my name, so as Cassie said, my name is Tara Pappas. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I'm a certified sex offender treatment provider. Uh, and in my career, I've held different certifications in trauma work as well. Uh, currently, I do work for a local nonprofit. We work with kids in treatment foster care and in residential care as well. And I provide clinical supervision to most of our therapists that are on staff, both in the residential program and in other programs that we have. So welcome. I'm really excited about this topic. I think it's a topic that we really need to talk about and think about. Um, and as we begin to look at what our objectives are going to be for today, um, I just kind of want to let you know that I can't really see your faces. I'm not going to be able to, to know if you're raising your hand or anything like that, but I do want to take questions at the end. Um, so definitely put things in the chat or hang on to it and, and unmute yourself at the end and we can talk about um, any questions you might have. So some of our objectives today, uh, we're going to look a little bit at the presentation of what serious mental illness will look like in children and adolescents, because as we know, uh, what we see in children is not always what we see in adults when it comes to diagnostics. We're going to identify some treatment modalities that could be used here. We're gonna look at early identification strategies and ways to be more preventative rather than reactive in this particular category. And we're really gonna look at the ethics of diagnosing. Um, when you have a young person in front of you who you think may or may not have so serious mental illness, we really need to be very, very careful about how we're diagnosing these particular kids. Um, once a diagnosis sort of goes on your record as it, as you know, so to speak, it, um, it stays there. It doesn't go away. Um, and sometimes that diagnosis is really helpful. It gets, it gets a young person's services. It gets them all sorts of things that they need. And sometimes it's really detrimental because it's not the right diagnosis for them, or it puts them in a category where they're not going to get the services that they need. And perhaps the stigma that they will have to deal with is going to be far greater than anything else. So just want to sort of set that up a little bit. I want to start with some definitions because I think we all need to be operating from the same definition. Um, so the definition by the National Institute of Mental Health for Serious Mental Illness, uh, it's defined as a mental behavioral emotional disorder that has serious functional impairment that interferes with or limits one or more major life activities. So when we're talking about major life activities, we're talking about a job, we're talking about school, we're talking about family, we're talking about community, those kinds of things It needs to really impact that, okay? Um, the burden of the mental illness is particularly concentrated among those who experience disability due to SMI. So what that means is, a lot of folks, particularly adults who are diagnosed with a serious mental illness, and we'll get to what those diagnoses are in just a moment, a lot of them are on uh, SSI or are on disability and are receiving um, funds because they're really not able to, to work a job or do things um, in any particular way because their mental illness is really uh, hindering their ability. The other definition that I really want to talk about, because it's another one that we use very often, is childhood serious emotional disturbance. Now, 
This definition is not coming out of the DSM. It's not something like that. It was actually created by SAMHSA. Um, and it was actually created for their grants. Like it, it came out of uh, wanting to be able to give pockets of money to different uh, programs and nonprofits to be able to help kids and adolescents. And so what it, what this is called and what this means, it's, it's defined as the presence of a diagnosable mental, behavioral, or emotional disorder results in functional impairment that interferes with or limits a child's role or functioning in family, school, or community activities. Now, what you're going to notice is the definition of childhood serious emotional disturbance quite mirrors the definition of serious mental illness. And so while these two things might uh, look at first glance to be different things, really they are sort of one and the same. So as we go through this, I'm going to be talking about um, serious mental illness or SMI for purposes of the presentation, but I want us to be aware that ch SMI and childhood serious emotional disturbance are really similar definitions with similar meanings and understandings, okay? All right, so some examples of what would be a serious mental illness under the DSM, right? And so we're looking at things like major depressive disorder, okay? Schizophrenia for adults, we'll see some prodromal symptoms, symptoms in younger kids, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, panic disorders in general, and then post-traumatic stress disorders uh, are some of those things. And when we're looking at our diagnostics, again, we always look at intensity, frequency, and duration of any symptoms that we're seeing in a young person. When we're looking at these particular diagnoses, we need to see a really high intensity, a really high frequency, a really high duration of the symptoms to be present before we can before we can make a diagnostic um, determination that it is a serious mental illness. It also has to impact daily functioning across all the life domains, okay? So we're talking about school, home, friends, uh, extracurricular activities, any other activities or things that might be uh, part of a young person's life this mental illness has to impact all of them. It's not like it only impacts them in school or it only impacts them in one area of their life. It really needs to impact them um, across a wide range of, of daily activities and life activities. Again, we often see this with disability benefits. And we also see the use of significant medications to control symptoms, right? We're looking at medications like lithium, um, I've seen Depakote prescribed. Um, I've seen a number of different medications prescribed uh, to try to alleviate or reduce the symptoms that are present for a lot of these young people. So these are just some examples. They're not, uh, you know, the only ones. But again, if we're going to make these diagnoses for young people, we need to make sure that we have done a full, complete, and thorough assessment before we do this, before we put this label onto a young person. And we'll talk about some stigma and some other things in just a few slides. I wanted to give you a little bit of data here. Uh, the data itself is probably going to change a lot. And I think COVID will certainly change these numbers greatly. But I wanted to give you just a small sense of the prevalence of this. So. In 2021, there was about 14 million adults, 18 and older, who were diagnosed with an SMI, right? Um, and this number represented about 5% of all of the adults in the United States. Presence of SMI, interestingly, is higher among females than males. And young adults, right, a younger population, the 18 to 25-year-olds, had the highest prevalence of serious mental illness at 11% compared to adults even just a year at 26 uh, to 49 at 7%, and then it goes down to 2% in the 50s, uh, when you're in your 50s. So when we talk about serious mental illness, we really are focusing very much on young people. And I know that 18 is the age of majority and the age that we talk about adult, you know, being an adult, 
the reality of that is actually very small, right? We have lots of, I have 18 year olds in my home who, while they're listed as an adult, still need a lot of help and guidance and those sorts of things. It's not like you turn 18 and suddenly magically something shifts in your brain and you're now an adult, right? It's it's a lot of these things. And what we're finding is with serious mental illness, um, the symptoms of this happen far before the age of 18. These symptoms were present uh, far before the age of 18. And this is where we really wanna do our interventions. And we really wanna make sure that we are um, we are intervening early to try to help young people not have such significant symptoms in adulthood. That's what we're looking for. Okay. Now, when you look here at at some of the um, sort of depression anxiety by age, um, again, this is 2021 data. And so when you look at this, when you look at depression, uh, you're looking at years in age, right? From three to five years old, they're pretty low, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, six to 11, it starts to go up. Now you're 12 to 17 spikes. Um, you see the same thing with anxiety. Now behavioral disorders, we see the spike sort of in that middle category there, that six to 11 year old. Uh, and then it decreases a bit in 12 to 17 year olds, however, the issue with the behavioral disorders in an older child, you know, 16, 17 year old, is you're now looking at someone who is close to adulthood and these behavioral issues really can impact them significantly once that magic number of 18 happens. So really want you to just sort of get a very general idea of what this looks like, a general sense of, of what the prevalence is. Again, this is looking at SAMHSA. This is 2020 data. Um, we're looking at, you know, 10% of the population meeting uh, serious emotional disturbance uh, and 9% me meeting serious mental illness. Okay. So again, serious emotional disturbance is going to be you're under 18. And for the purposes of SAMHSA, the SMI is going to be your 18 and older. So as you're looking at this slide, just sort of keep that in mind. OK, so really just want you to have a sense of the prevalence of it, how how much of it is out there um, and how much of it we see in our young people, in our young population, how much of it is out there. So there are some pretty clear risk factors that are involved um, and that we see with young people who do have a diagnosis of serious mental illness, right? Some of the risk factors are family mental health and substance abuse issues, right? Abuse or use issues. Um, there have been research studies that have connected mental illness in a genetic way for lots of uh, families, but also just generally family mental health if you have folks in your family who do have significant mental health of their own, that's considered a risk factor for lots of reasons. Uh, we have our adverse childhood experiences, right? Our ACEs. Um, and obviously, the more, uh, the higher that number, the higher the risk is. We look at racial disparities and what that means and how that impacts serious mental illness, both in its diagnosing uh, in the assessment phase and in the intervention phase, how that is impacted. Social isolation is so, so critical uh, when you're looking at whether or not symptomology in serious mental illness is gonna become worse or get a little bit better. Social isolation is linked pretty clearly with serious mental illness becoming worse for a young person. Uh, trauma will of course impact it. And then sort of food and housing insecurities, your economic stress, poverty, right? We think of Maslow here and we think of, um, you know, that, that wonderful pyramid that we've all looked at over and over again. And if we don't have some of the basics, uh, our mental health is going to suffer. It is going to um, become a little bit worse because uh, if you don't have the basics of what you need, it's really hard to work on your mental health issues and really hard to take care of yourself. So these are risk factors. No one risk factor will predict serious mental illness, okay? Typically, we see a combination of these risk factors. So I don't want you to feel like, well, 
you know, I have a kid who has some trauma. So therefore, like, it doesn't work like that. There's these things are in combination, they're, they're coming together, we often see almost all of these coming into play when you're looking at serious mental illness. Okay. I do want to focus for a moment here for um, youth of color, you know, the impact of racism on development in general is, is enormous. Um, we see barriers and discrimination in achieving care and achieving interventions, even in achieving a correct diagnosis. Sometimes we are seeing some significant barriers in there. Um, you know, some of the statistics that come out, again, some of this is 2021 data, is we've got, you know, the suicide rate for white youth ages 10 to 24 can go, often goes down by 3%. Um, but the suicide rates for, you know, American Indian, Alaska Native, uh, Asian, Black, Hispanic increase significantly. So we need to look at that. We need to look at what that means in terms of serious mental illness, in terms of symptomology. We need to look at how the impact of racism uh, can, I don't want to say mask the symptoms of serious mental illness, but sometimes we mistaken those symptoms for serious mental illness and vice versa. We look at all those kinds of things. Um, and just access to services is one of the other things that we really need to take a look at and focus here. Um, so again, just some more interesting um, things, more interesting data points to take a look at when we're looking at risk factors for this particular diagnostic category. Okay. The other risk factor that is really significant uh, for young people particularly, okay, when we're talking about adolescents, we're talking about this stigma here, okay? I don't want to have a mental illness. I don't want this to be true. Um, and there are lots of things that play into that, right? We have cultural ideas regarding mental illness that can contribute to the experience of a youth who does have a serious mental illness or who may be having symptomology. Maybe they're not diagnosed yet, but they're having symptoms or symptomology. And the culture says, no, that's not anything that you have or no, we're not going to deal with that or no, we don't believe in that. That young person's not going to get the care that they need and those symptoms are going to become worse. They're not just going to get better. Uh, we look at the impact of media and social media on the perceptions of serious mental illness. And this is a double-edged sword, right? On the one hand, social media is making mental illness something that we talk about, something that's a little bit more prevalent in our conversation. And on the other side of it, you have folks who are, you know, helping kids learn how to self-harm or, or, or talking about, you know, ways to, to harm yourself or, or other things like that. Um, so social media can have some, some good things uh, and it can have some really detrimental things as well. Um, stigma feeds into other types of treatment or the use of alternative methods to deal with symptoms. So again, in our young population, we do see a number of kids who come, particularly who come to our residential programs or even in our foster care programs who have symptomology that could be serious mental illness. And they're trying to use marijuana to fix that or alcohol to fix that, or they're turning to drugs to treat symptoms that are truly symptoms of a mental illness. Um, and they're really utilizing what they would call alternative methods. Um, I worked with a young man who said, all I need is a little bit of weed. If I get a little bit of weed, everything's good. Everything's good, Miss Pappas, if I have a little bit of weed. Um, and when I would talk to him about medications or other things, um, he would say, no, no, no. If I take a medication, that means I'm sick. I don't want to be sick. So there's a lot of stigma attached to this, right? Um, when we look at cultural factors and things like that, we really do look at um, you know, families and, and the, their beliefs about mental illness, their beliefs about whether or not their children can have a mental illness or should have a mental illness. Um, I've worked with any number of families that have said, well, they don't really have a mental illness. It's just a behavior problem because a behavior problem is something that you can fix, whereas a mental illness is something that you can't fix uh, for these folks, right? And there's also a lot of stigma and belief that if you're diagnosed with a serious mental illness, then that means you're not going to be able to achieve anything in life, that somehow that will hold you back. And that's just not true. 
Um, but there is a lot of stigma and myth out there about the impact of serious mental illness and, and what that means for young people and for their families in general. Okay. I wanna look here at the impact on development because again, we are talking about young people. We are talking about young people who are, who are in various developmental stages. And when you look at symptomology of mental illness, you have to look at how that impacts the development of a young person. So when we look at that, we look at sort of four interrelated problems that most impact our adolescents, right? Our young people. We look at peer pressure, which we all know is significant. Um, it's growing again with that influx of social media. We are really, really looking at the impact and how difficult uh, and how wonderful peer pressure or peer relationships can be. We are looking at family dynamics, right? Um, I have worked with families who have done everything that they can to help their child, uh, whatever that is. They've changed their parenting. They've changed the color of their sheets. They've changed you know, what they cook for dinner because it, it made a difference for their child. And I have worked with families who were unwilling to change anything because mental illness is um, the problem of the kid and you just need to fix my kid and everything will be okay. So we have to look at family dynamics. When we look at family dynamics, we have to look at the culture of the family, right? What does that family believe about mental illness? What does that family believe about a person being able to move forward in life with a mental illness? Um, we have to look at academic challenges, but academics in general, right? What is the focus of adolescents? It's school. That's where all of them go is school. Um, and school is a place where they can get a lot of rewards, you know, achievement, um, or where they can find the greatest struggles. And for a young person who is experiencing serious mental illness, academics can be really challenging. Um, when you're when you're trying to work through feelings of depression or trauma and trying to pay attention in class, those things are really difficult. And so we see a lot of academic challenges for young people. We see 504 plans, we see IEPs that are done, um, and we see interventions just by school counselors sometimes to try to help kids maintain while they're in school. And this last one is really, really important, identity development, right? At this stage in life, your 15 year olds, your 16, your 17 year olds, they're trying to identify themselves. They're trying to establish themselves as an independent person from their parents. And when you have symptomology associated with serious mental illness, that's really hard. That's really hard. Um, to be independent, to, to be able to, to create an identity for yourself of who you are, your values, your thoughts, your beliefs. Um, alternately, what I've seen in some young people is they've been diagnosed with a serious mental illness and that becomes their identity. That's all that they can see of themselves is this mental illness. This is all that I am. Uh, and it becomes so much of their identity that the idea of getting better, of moving forward, or of achieving goals is scary because if I'm not a mentally ill person, who am I? Um, we treat a lot of young people who have fallen into that because mental illness has become the thing that identifies them. Um, so each of these things shape the adolescent experience. Um, and what I want to say to you about this is as we work with young people who have serious mental illness, we have got to keep this in mind, <laughs> excuse me. We've got to remember that we have young people who don't have a fully developed personality, who don't have a fully developed sense of who they are, um, who have some really normal developmental things that we need to keep in mind and remember are, are okay, are normal and might not be a part of serious mental illness. So we really need to pay attention to this and we really need to look at these developmental stages because if we don't, 
If we don't look at that, we're going to be missing a really critical point for these kids in helping them be able to understand perhaps their mental illness and then be able to move forward from it so it does not become the identifying factor. Um, I go back to, you know, Erickson, right? We go back to each of these categories and each of these things. And the one that I'm obviously focusing on here is the adolescence category, right? Identity versus role confusion. Now, as we know, each of these stages builds on the other, right? Um, we've all had sort of our, our teachings in Erickson, but each of these stages builds on the other. And if you're having symptomology associated with serious mental illness, these stages are gonna, gonna be, children and young people going through these stages will go through them differently, might not go through them at all, might go through them in a strange way, might go back and forth in them. Um, we often talk about um, some of the work that we do with the young folks, particularly in our residential program, is you have a young person's chronological age, right? 15 year old, 16 year old, but then you have their emotional age. And sometimes that's younger, sometimes that's different. Um, and so when you're looking on this scale and when you're thinking, well, you know, you're 16 now, you should be able to do these things, maybe not. It may be that the symptomology of the mental illness has made it such that they're not able to do that yet, that we've got to to go back a little bit and redo some things, reteach some things, understand that the skill is not there uh, and we need to do some additional teaching in those categories, right? So the idea here for the adolescence portion is we don't want serious mental illness to number one, become the identity of that particular young person. And we don't, we, we want to intervene. We want to intervene. We want to address the symptomology. Um, and we want to make sure that adolescents at this point understand what the symptoms mean, understand how to manage those symptoms and understand that those symptoms are not a definition or an identifying factor of who they are for the rest of their lives, right? Um, mental illness in general interrupts this developmental stage. And our job as clinicians is to get this back on track in lots of ways so that young people can move forward into their young adulthood, into maturity with a good sense of who they are and a sense that, yes, I have this mental illness and I can do all the things that I want to do. I simply need to manage it, right? It's like a medical issue. If I manage my medical issue, I can do the things I want to do. If I don't manage it, I'm not going to get to do the things that I want to do. So I just sort of want that point to be there. Um, again, just sort of giving you the, the psychosocial stage is just another uh, way of looking at this. Um, but what I want to point out here, again, in that adolescence category is social relationships. What's the important event, right? Social relationships. A young person's ability to be social, to interact with people, to talk to people their own age, to be parts of groups or different things, uh, to feel a sense of belonging in their lives, a belonging with a friendship group, a belonging in other ways is critical. And very often the symptomology of serious mental illness um, takes that away. And so very often I see young people in our program who don't have very good social skills uh, because they don't know how to be part of a group because they've spent so much time isolated in their rooms. Or I see young people who are afraid to go outside, afraid to participate in groups because they've not been successful at it before. And so when we're talking about working with kids and adolescents who have serious mental illness, we really need to focus on the things that are critical for that group. And one of the critical things is relationships, relationship building, having positive relationships, um, being able to create positive relationships. This is the age where people date. How do we do that in a way that's healthy for us? So those are all of the kinds of things that we need to look at, again, as clinicians looking at this particular category of diagnoses. Um, and so, you know, I'm, this is sort of saying the same thing, but the other thing that I wanna point out here is 
there's lots of um, issues with this particular group of young people with having confidence in making decisions, good decisions for themselves, um, having confidence in being able to take care of things and do things on their own. Um, we see a really, we, we often call that self-esteem, right? They have really low self-esteem. Well, with low self-esteem comes low confidence in yourself. And so for young people with serious mental illness, part of our job is to help them manage the symptoms, but to remind them that, again, this mental illness doesn't mean you can't do things, doesn't mean that you can't overcome or move ahead. Um, the other thing that we see with great frequency, great frequency with young people who are diagnosed with serious mental illness is issues with self-soothing and self-regulation, right? Really lack the ability to self-soothe in any situation really lack the ability to communicate about emotions or to communicate in general. Um, I've worked with a number of young people where their communication, they could not find the words for it. So we had to do it in another way. And I've done it through music, through art. Um, I had one young person who could not, they just could not speak it. So we wrote it. Um, but when you're talking about young people, you've got to really be able to be creative about how you help them to move forward. Um, the stages on the on the other side here are just sort of the stages of a mental health condition. And the reason I wanna point this out um, because our next slides are gonna talk about some presenting symptoms are we often see this well before it becomes a full-blown um, diagnosis, right? We see symptomology. We see some things that are, are perhaps mild in the beginning, but then become more and more and more significant, right? So stage one here is this mild symptoms, mild warning signs, mild um, oddities, right? I remember talking with one mom um, who talked about her child. Um, she would have all sorts of different play dates for her child and her child never played with another child. They weren't upset. They just never interacted or played with another child. That's something that pay attention to, right? Um, and we're talking about, you know, a seven-year-old, not a two-year-old, makes a difference, okay? Again, you have to look at those developmental stages. And as you go through these stages, you start to see symptomology increase. And starting in sort of stage two and stage three, it's interfering with basic life uh, daily activities, right? Being able to go to school, being able to hold a part-time job, drive a car, all of those things. All right, so what is the presentation of serious mental illness? What does this look like, right? Okay, Terry, you've told us a lot of stuff, but now what does this look like? So we're gonna do a couple of slides on this, but what you're seeing is someone who is consistently moving in a sort of a downward spiral in all of their life domains. So you're seeing poor academics often, you're seeing isolation, you're seeing uh, young people not wanting to join groups. You're seeing uh, young people not, not really wanting to interact with their peers, okay? But you're seeing things consistently sort of move in a downward way rather than in any other way. We often see an early diagnosis of mood disorders, like that old mood disorder NOS, right? There's a mood problem here. We don't know what it is, but it's here. Um, we see that. We see uh, the diagnosis of major depressive disorder. I have seen that in children as young as 10. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying I'm, I've seen it. Okay. But we often see mood issues or mood disorders. Again, I've worked with a lot of families that say to me, you know, my child has always been really irritable. My child has always been um, really up and down. You know, they start to make these sort of descriptors that um, happened very early in childhood and seem to have over the course of time grown worse rather than better. Um, psychosis or psychotic-like symptoms. Um, again, we see things like a major depressive disorder with psychotic symptoms, right? And if we're seeing that, that's a pretty clear indicator that we've got something we need to intervene with quickly, all right? Uh, when you look at some of the data here, 70% of youth when, with anxiety or emotional problems are considered high risk for developing serious mental illness. Not every young person who has that diagnosis will have a serious mental illness, but it's one of those things that we're seeing as a precursor to a lot of them. Um, we see lots of negative emotions, emotional reactivity, 
difficulties with uh, dysregulation. You know, it's just sort of, again, that same concept of not being able to regulate, not being able to self-soothe, not being able to handle emotions, no matter what they might be. Um, and we also see sort of negative schemas and maladaptive thinking, right? We see, we call this in cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, our thoughts and what those thoughts represent or mean. So we often see young people, I've, I've worked with young people where their, their schemas of the world are the world is unsafe. Nobody likes me. Um, I'm not good enough. Um, a lot of maladaptive thinking or cognitive distortions that we might look at is um, I see a lot of denial in the young people that I've worked with, but I also see a lot of just sort of um, maladaptive thinking in, I, you know, if I just do this thing, it'll, it'll make everything better. If I just do that, it'll make everything better. So that's a little bit of the presentation. I wanna talk a little bit now though about psychosis in general and very specifically. Psychosis is one of those things that um, is a significant precursor to a serious mental illness. We often think of it as a precursor to schizophrenia, not always, but often think of it as that way, right? And so let's talk a little bit about psychosis here. So when you're talking about psychosis in young people, we are not typically going to diagnose a young person with schizophrenia, right? According to the DSM, we really can't because we would need to see a significant break. Oftentimes that doesn't happen until they're into young adulthood. Often, not always, okay? But what we do see is, uh, is, is what we call prodromal symptoms, right? A prodrome is really a medical term for early signs or symptoms of an illness or a health problem. And so what we are saying here is psychosis is an illness that has a specific prodrome, right? The signs and symptoms start well before the full symptoms of psychosis appear, uh, like hallucinations and delusions. Typically, we see this in later teenage years, okay? Very recently, had a young person in our residential program who was convinced that the government was watching her, uh, was convinced that the government had put uh, small bugs in her bloodstream uh, to monitor her movement, and was convinced that these bugs um, had changed her, her bone density. Um, and wanted to go for bone scans, wanted to have um, bone marrow transplants, all sorts of things. That's what we're talking about, okay? This was a young person who was about 16 and a half, almost 17, uh, when we're looking at these kind of symptoms. Now, a young person saying to you, I hear voices, we need about that. So I don't want you to hear me say, okay, this person saying they hear voices, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. That's not necessarily the case. A lot of times when young people tell you that they hear voices, we need to ask a lot of questions about that. What are the voices? What are they saying? Or is it your voice? Is it someone else's voice? Uh, is it telling you what to do? I can, the, the number of young people that I have worked with who tell me that they hear voices is extremely high. And when I do more assessment with them, when I talk with them, when I ask more questions, what I find out often is it is a replay of past trauma, very often a replay of past trauma, or it is their own voice telling them how terrible they are or how horrible they are. Very rarely do I see a young person who is um, what I would consider close to psychosis, okay? Um, so these symptoms are always a cause for concern. It's not guaranteed that a serious mental illness diagnosis or disorder will happen, but clearly these are things we do need to look at and assess, right? The other thing that we see with um, these prodromal symptoms is a significant withdrawing from friends and family or feeling suspicious of others. So this young person I just told you about, um, came into our residential program, had not gone to school for about six months, um, had not talked to any friends in that amount of time, and was convinced that their mother was trying to poison their food. Um, so again, lots of, lots of concerning things were happening in this case, okay? Uh, less concern with appearance or hygiene, difficulty organizing thoughts and speech, um, a loss of interest in activities, a development of unusual ideas or behaviors, unusual perceptions, right? Visions or hearing voices or seeing shadows, that sort of thing. 
um, an overall change in personality or um, feelings of grandiosity. Um, this young this young person that I worked with was very much convinced that they could change um, how the earth worked. I don't know what that meant. We could never quite get to what that meant, but really felt like they could do that. Um, what you will notice though here is some of the things that I've just listed are things for other mental illness disorders, are things that we see in kids who have trauma, are things um, that maybe are uh, like the one for development of unusual ideas or behaviors. You've gotta be really careful with that one. I remember working with a young person um, who believed very much in spirits and being able to talk to spirits. Um, and at first blush, that that looks concerning. And then I talked more and I talked with mom and I talked with dad. And what I learned was culturally, that was something that they believed in, that they could talk to spirits, that, that this was a comforting thing, that this was part of their culture and their religion. And so you have to be really careful about what these symptoms may or may not mean and what this may or may not represent. And I cannot stress enough to ask questions, lots of them. Your job as a clinician is to be as curious as you can possibly be so that you can get information that you need to figure out what intervention this young person is not is going to need. Okay. Um, the other thing that I want to say here is that um, about 35% of young people who have sort of these prodromal symptoms will convert that or that will shift into a serious mental illness diagnosis. So it's a really high percentage, but it's not everyone. So again, we need to be really careful about what we're what we're saying, what we're looking at, um, and what we are diagnosing before that happens. What we might see behaviorally, okay, are things like high rates of hospitalizations right? Always in the hospital, in and out of acute. Um, a recent young person who came into our residential program has been in and out of 15 acute hospitalizations in a period of two years. That's significant, okay? Very significant. I don't want to minimize the young person who's been in the hospital once, but we are looking at some of these numbers to say, wow, you know, what does this mean? Um, we see a high usage of crisis teams or mobile units um, for these particular young people. We see significant use of community-based services, um, often many at a time, and often with little or no impact or change for that young person or their family. Um, so think about things like in-home services, uh, TDT services in the school, uh, outpatient counseling. Those are the kinds of things that we're talking about there. We do see lots of young people with multiple residential treatment program admissions. Um, this same young person who had so many hospitalizations had been in and out of four residentials uh, in their lifetime, and they were 15 when they got to us. So makes a difference. Um, behaviorally, we do see significant difficulties with relationships. And I think the interesting thing to note here is these young people want relationships. They want to belong. They want to feel a part of something. And often the symptomology really gets in the way of that being able to happen. Um, we do see outward issues of things like aggression. We see a very high rate of self-harm. We see a higher rate with young ladies than we do with young men, although that's shifting and changing rather quickly. Um, we do see lots of suicidal ideation sometimes with an intent and plan, sometimes not. Um, more often, we see young people using suicidal ideations as a way of conveying emotions that they have no other way of being able to describe. Um, I've also had young people say to me, well, when I say that, at least somebody knows I'm hurting and they can do something about it because I don't know how to explain it any other way. So we look at it that way. And we do look at substance use or abuse to treat, you know, quote unquote, treat symptoms. Young people often have been doing that. Um, the one, the, the particular uh, thing that I have seen most young people do who have been in our programs has been marijuana. Doesn't mean that's the only thing that people use. It's just something that I see with a lot of frequency. Um, 
we're my my particular residential is not a uh, substance abuse program so we would not have accepted kids with other things um but we often see marijuana sometimes alcohol being used to dull symptoms to lower symptoms uh if that's what they need to have happen okay when we look at screening and assessment when we look at how we screen and how we assess for this there's no one screening that will say yep this kid definitely has an smi this is the screening tool you're going to use this is it there is none of those there are none there is no tool there is no assessment tool all by itself that will tell you that there are lots and lots of tools out there that you can use Here's the thing. Um, assessments are really good at predicting current behavior and current uh, thoughts and feelings. They are lousy at being able to predict anything in the future. So if you're giving a young person like a Beck depression inventory, it will tell you how they are right now. It will not tell you how they are tomorrow or the next day, or in six months, or in a year. So all of our assessment tools, while they might give us a base, a place to work from, something to look at, um, they are not in and of themselves something that you need to rely on. I would not point to the Beck and go, see, they have depression. Beck in conjunction with symptoms, in conjunction with impact on life domains, in conjunction with what this young person is saying to you, in conjunction with what the family is saying to you, in conjunction with your holistic assessment of who that young person is, that's how you use the assessments. You do not use them all by themselves and say, well, they scored high here, so that must mean they've got this. Let me write this down as a diagnosis. That's not how assessments are used. Um, assessments should be something that is part, these kinds of assessments, these sorts of screenings should be used as part of that bigger biopsychosocial assessment that we do with our clients, right? We need to understand the cultural implications. We need to understand the family impl implications. We need to understand, are they you know, new to this country? That makes a huge difference in how and how things are perceived. We need to understand language differences. Um, and I don't mean, you know, I speak one language and my family speaks another. I mean, we might be speaking the same language, but meaning two totally different things. So you've got to have clarification. You've got to really be able to talk to people um, before, before you make a diagnosis, not after. The only way to make an accurate ethical, real diagnosis is to do all of these things. Um, and even then, even then, when you give a diagnosis, you don't go for the highest, worst thing you can possibly give somebody. You try to figure out, okay, where, where would I start? What is my differential? What do I need to look at? And what do I diagnose this, with this young person with that makes sense, that's logical, and that has clinical meaning that gives me a place where I can conceptualize my case and I can provide an intervention for that child and that family. That's what a diagnosis ought to be able to do. And these assessment tools are helpful. They're certainly helpful, but they are not the only thing that you should be doing in an assessment with a young person and, and their family um, as you go through. Um, there are any number of screening tools and assessments. I've given you a couple on this slide, but there are, uh, you know, any number of them that you can give. One caution I will give you is when you are working with adolescents, you have to make sure that the scale you're using is for adolescents. You cannot give a 15-year-old a scale meant for an adult. You're not going to get an accurate reading, right? So make sure that whatever you're using has been um, validated for an adolescent population before you do it. I don't know. Some of these uh, screening tools are for younger kids as well, but again, it has to be validated for that age group before you can use it and feel like it has any weight or validity in your assessment.
Okay. All right. So there's some diagnostic considerations that I want you to think about. Um, and these are kind of really specific when you talk about serious mental illness. And, and they're significant, again, because of issues like stigma. They're significant because this diagnosis will follow this young person for the rest of their lives. So if we're going to give a diagnosis of a serious mental illness, we really need to, to think about how is this going to go. And some of the ethical questions, these aren't all of them, but some of the questions we need to ask ourselves is, can telling my client about a high-risk status harm them? So for this young person that I talked about um, who had some of what looked like prodromal symptoms, right? Um, was it Would it be appropriate for me to then say to this young person, you know, this is really what schizophrenia looks like. That seems to be the path you're taking. Good luck. Is that helping them in any way? Am I offering them anything? Or by saying that to them, am I causing more harm? Um, so we have to really think about how we talk to our clients, what we say to them, the context with which we provide that information matters for a young person and their families, right? And then the second question I want you to think about is, what are the best ways to inform someone of a high risk, risk status in order to prevent harm? So, uh, you know, if I have a young person in front of me who um, I'm really concerned about, am I going to say, well, you know, you're showing these prodromal symptoms and really what this does in research is it links you to blah, 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 right? This young person doesn't really care about that. But a way that I can present it to them is I'm really worried about these things and I'd like to find a way to help you manage them, work through them, understand them now, right? Huge difference in how that's received by a young person and their family, okay? Now, I, I'm always going to advocate telling the truth. You always tell your client the truth. You don't lie to your clients, but how you tell your client matters. How you present this matters. Um, how your, your sense of hopefulness or hopelessness for your clients matters. So you have to be in a place as a clinician to be able to talk about these things in words that your client understands, right? Remember, we're talking about adolescence and it really has to be done in a way that is um, helpful. That is something that will help this person to move forward in their life and to manage their symptoms and feel like they can do good things. OK, um, the other thing to really think about is some cultural implications. I have worked with some families um, whose culture is if I am the you know, the not the doctor, but the, the person who knows everything, the professional. Right. Then whatever I think is what they're going to believe. I'm not saying that's good or bad. It just is. Um, and so we really need to be very careful, again, about how we present these things. Um, we need to be careful that we're not making choices for young people or making choices for their families. We need to make sure that they are making choices that are right for them. And so we've got to be careful about that piece. Um, the only argument I've ever heard about not fully disclosing a diagnosis or, or symptomology uh, is to prevent undue stress or exacerbate symptoms. I think that's really an old kind of argument. I don't think that that's really a modern discussion or an argument. Um, and it's not one that I take particularly seriously. Again, I'm, I'm into truth telling. I'm into telling people what the truth is in a way and with context that helps them to understand it and be able to move forward and have some solutions about that. Um, there's also the argument that if I don't tell you that you have a mental health diagnosis, then I'm gonna protect you from stigma, I'm going to protect you from a self-fulfilling prophecy and all of these other things. I think the fallacy in that is young people know when something's wrong. Families know when something is wrong. And when you're denying it or you're not speaking it, a lot of times you add to fear. And that's not something that is helpful for anyone, let alone someone who is dealing with some serious mental illness things. Okay, so... How do we intervene? How do we begin to say, what do I do, right? So what we do know is that, um, and I'm gonna be on, the, on my right-hand side, I think it's your right-hand side, but we're gonna focus on education 
right? Psychoeducation on the diagnosis itself, what that means, what does that look like? We're probably going to have to do some education on medication. What does that mean? What are the medications that are out there? Uh, are they effective? Are they not effective? What does that mean? Does it change my life? Right? We're going to have to make sure that we include the family. When you're talking about adolescents or children, you are talking about them and you are talking about their family. They are part of a family. It's not like they exist here and the family exists over here and they don't meet up anywhere, right? The family needs to be in on this. We need to have conversations. We need to talk about this. We need for this to be an open line of communication so that these young people have support. And so that parents and families have support and understand what's going on. Um, we need so, so, so much to make sure that there's integration with the family, with the community. We need to make sure we don't isolate. Don't isolate in your room, don't isolate from friends, don't isolate from family. The more social and community and family connections we have, the better that young person is going to do, okay? And we need to set reasonable expectations for success, right? It's not like you're going to take a medication or go through outpatient therapy and suddenly this is going to be all gone and you don't have to think about it ever again. That's not really the reality. The reality is we need to know how to understand it, manage it, and address it, okay? Um, if you look on the left side here, early diagnosis and treatment are critical for positive outcomes. Some of the research that is out there is saying, look, the sooner you get in there, the sooner you begin to apply interventions the better the outcome is for this young person, the better the outcome, not only in their adolescent years, but further into their adulthood, into their, you know, other um, later adulthood years, you will see a much more positive outcome if we intervene early, quickly, compassionately. Okay. Uh, this second bullet point here, half of all serious adult psychiatric disorders start by age 14. Okay. But but treatment sometimes doesn't begin for six to 23 years after the onset. So if we're seeing something happening at 14, address it at 14. Don't address it at 20. Don't address it at 50. Address it at 14 because you're going to have a far better outcome for that young person than if you address it too late. Um, and then including family, right? I am a very big, very big proponent of including family, particularly when you're working with kids and adolescents. The family is an incredibly large part of how well they do or how poorly they will do. Um, and the more support we can give families, the better they will do, the better they will function. Okay, so when we look at evidence-based interventions, right, there's a ton of interventions out there, ton of interventions out there, ton of interventions that we could uh, potentially use. One of the, the basics uh, for me is always trauma-informed therapy, right? This provides your foundation. This is how you treat people. This is how you set up your programs. This is how, this is how your office looks, right? This is the basics of being able to provide safety and security for your clients so that they can begin to work through a lot of these issues, right? Um, for me, these are the basics of how you interact with people right? In your, you know, in your own knowledge and in your own competence, you have to understand trauma. You have to understand the impact of it, the impact on brain and neural functioning and symptomology and all of those things, right? Um, you have to come in as a clinician with compassion, with empathy, with understanding, uh, being able to be curious about things, um, you have to be able to provide safety and stability, partly in the in the space that you create, right, when you do your own therapy, but also create some safety, perhaps in the home or in the community. Are there things that we can do together? Can we plan for things? So it's not so frightening. So it's not so scary. Okay. Um, collaboration and empowerment. I am huge on collaboration. You have an outpatient provider. Let's go talk to them. Come on. You have another case manager, bring them, right? The more collaboration we have among providers means that that young person and that family is going to get a cohesive plan of action rather than these little bits here and there that don't ever seem to add up anywhere. Um, 
cultural humility and responsiveness. I think we've talked a lot about that. And then for me, mental illness is not the end of anything. It is a thing we need to understand, manage, work with, and move forward. Okay. So when we look at resiliency and we look at healing, can I make a mental illness go away? No. Can I help create an attitude? Can I help create a belief that I can do this? I can overcome. I can move forward. I know I need to manage my mental illness. I don't want this. I know I don't want it. And I know I need to manage it. Um, I have an aunt who was just diagnosed with diabetes. Right. And she said to me, I don't want this. This means I have to change my eating habits. I have to change my life. I have to go to the gym. I don't want this. And I said, well, what are you going to do about it? She said, well, I'm going to manage it because I, it's my responsibility. I have to take care of it. I see mental illness in very much the same way. You might not want it. I get that. Um, and there are ways to manage it and not make the mental illness run your life. You run your life. Um, one of the most successful interventions when you're talking about serious mental illness is cognitive behavioral therapy. The amount of research that I could find on cognitive behavioral health therapy and how well it works, particularly for young people with serious mental illness, this is it. This is where it's at. OK, um, it's well researched. It's widely used. It's taught. I know in VCU's program because I teach it, um, but it's taught in other social work programs as well. You can do this and modify it for a younger population. You can do this with young kids. I have done it with young kids with great success. Um, it can be done with families. And I've done it with great success. You talk about some of these ideas and these things. People get this. They, they understand it. Um, and there are lots of ways to interrupt or break negative cycles that when families get to talking about it or a young person gets to talking about it, you begin to see some change. Um, so cognitive behavioral, the use of this cognitive triangle is really, really critical um, in being able to work through issues of serious mental illness, issues of stigma, issues of identity, right? Issues of um, self-esteem and confidence. This is one of the best um, you know, models to use. When we think about other therapies or interventions, right, we think about psychotherapies. I've already told you about cognitive behavioral. You know, you've got other things like exposure therapy or DBT or things like that. All of these things have their place, right? There are usefulness um, for each one of these things. And so there's that. There's the use of medications. And while I don't want medication to be this sort of magic pill that's going to make everything all better, the use of medication for some young people can be life-changing. So we really need to have a thoughtful, honest consideration of, is medication worth trying? Uh, do we need to change a medication that they've been on for a long time because it's not working anymore? Medication should be an open, honest, transparent conversation. Um, not to force anyone to do anything, but to present a holistic set of options that people can look at and utilize as they as they work through this. OK, and then we look at things like complementary therapies, right? We look at exercise, yoga, mindfulness, art or music therapy. A lot of these things are extremely helpful for people who have serious mental illness. Adolescents, um, we teach most of our adolescents mindfulness skills. We teach them grounding techniques. We talk about a healthy diet. We talk about exercise. We exercise, right? All of these things add to a person's ability to feel better, right? That's the idea is to feel better. And so these are also things that we really need to take a look at. Um, when we look at sort of psychosocial therapies, I don't want you to look at this and say, okay, Tara had this on her slide, so this is what I have to do. Please don't read it like that. But these are some of the therapies that through research we are finding are, are very helpful for these particular diagnoses, right? So for depression, cognitive behavioral, um, the research on this basically says cognitive behavioral is one of the best interventions you can use for a person who has depression. Um, and that includes major depressive disorder, okay? So if you're looking at your serious mental illness diagnosis, you are looking at, you know, depression. 
for anxiety, um, biofeedback, exposure therapies, mindfulness, um, for any young person and their family members that I have ever worked with who have anxiety, um, and, and anxiety, not, not your normal sense of anxiety, but sort of that heightened anxiety, we do a lot with mindfulness. We do a lot of discussion about what that is, how that can calm you. And we use CBT as well, cognitive behavioral in there, because a lot of times our thoughts get away from us. And so anxiety, I couple those things, mindfulness and cognitive behavioral therapy are two things that are really effective. Um, OCD, exposure and response therapy is a really good therapy to use with folks who have genuine obsessive compulsive disorder. I've worked with a number of young people who are absolutely fabulous and they're like, you know, I have a touch of OCD and I'll say a, a touch and they'll say, yeah, you know, I have to have my clothes in a certain order or I, or I need my, you know, my things lined up in a certain way. And I'll say, well, what happens if they're not lined up that way? Well, I just go ahead and fix them. I mean, they're, you know, I just have to fix it. It's not a big deal. That's not OCD. That's not a touch of OCD. Okay. OCD is something that impacts your ability to function in a daily basis. Um, um, Post-traumatic stress disorder. EMDR is fantastic. Uh, when working with folks who have a diagnosis of PTSD. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is also incredibly useful and helpful in this category as well. Um, for folks who are diagnosed with bipolar, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, peer support, understanding symptomology and how to manage it are critical for someone who has bipolar disorder. Um, and then for psychosis, open dialogue, um, is, is superior for the first episode of psychosis. And then CBT helps people to cope with and reduce symptomology um, of psychosis. Now, having said that, um, if you are working with someone who, who genuinely has psychosis, you are probably working with someone who also needs to be on medication. And that's gonna make a really big difference in how um, the particular therapies go. So these are just some examples of interventions and therapies that you can use for folks who have serious mental illness. Okay. Um, I like this slide. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it, but I'll spend a little bit here just talking about how to build emotional resilience in kids. Um, COVID is teaching us a lot of things and it's teaching us that uh, our children need a lot more uh, guidance when it comes to working with emotions, when it comes to understanding their emotions, when it comes to regulation, and they need that guidance to come from their caregivers and not from TikTok, uh, because TikTok's not gonna help them understand their emotions very well. So um, some of the things on here are things that I talk about in family therapy with many families, but things like talking about your own feelings as a parent and being able to say, I'm terrified, I'm really scared. Um, and this is what I'm doing to try to calm myself down um, or being able to say to young people, I'm so proud of you, being able to give praise and validation where it's needed. Right. Quality time uh, is something that uh, young people, adolescents will always say to me, oh, I can't stand my parents. I hate my rat, rat, rat. I don't like my parents. And then I say to them, what's the thing that, that you really enjoy about your parents? I really like it when we go out together. I really like it when we go to the movies together. I really like game night, right? So I know their words are, I don't like it, I don't like it. But the way that it makes them feel, that sense of belonging is very much there um, when, when quality time happens. Um, allowing kids to solve some of their own problems is really helpful. Letting kids fail sometimes is a good thing. We need to let them to be able to see natural consequences. Um, I worked with a young, uh, young man whose mom would not let him fail. She did his schoolwork. She made his bed. She did everything for him because she didn't want him to fail. Um, and when that finally happened for him, he didn't know what to do. He had no skills to work through that, no problem solving skills. Um, and so in our want to protect our children, we have to make sure that we allow them some moments of having to figure things out for themselves as well. Um, and then, you know, just sort of making sure that our kids are eating well, please make sure they're getting enough sleep. Lord knows none of us get what we should get, uh, but young people certainly need it even more. Um, 
family and serious mental illness. Um, I've said a lot of this already, but working with families, we really need to be able to provide a safe space where they can talk and share and vent some of their deepest fears and worries and concerns, and even their anger. Um, I've worked with many a family that have said, I'm just so angry that they have this mental illness. I didn't want that for them. I know. Um, let's talk about it. Let's work our way through that. Um, Psychoeducation for families is really important. Ensuring social connections is really important. Um, having a parent or parents find their own therapist so that they can work out some things is really, really helpful. And I, I always say to parents, find your own therapist so that you have a space where you can talk about the things that are impacting you. Um, have some patience, have some self-care. I'm a big believer in support groups that are um, that look to uplift their members, that look to provide them with resources and space um, to, to talk through things, to get help, to be able to have a conversation with somebody who, who sort of has dealt with that before is really helpful as well. Um, I do want to talk very briefly about, I know I'm running out of time a little bit. Um, I want to talk about some systemic things that are happening as well. We know for young people with serious mental illness or with a mental health diagnosis, we've they have to go through a lot of systems to try to get them the care that they need. And sometimes those systems don't work nice together. They don't play well, um, or it's really hard to get into them, or we don't have resources or all that kind of stuff. So as you look at this slide, what I want you to get from this is there is so much and so much we have to go through to get young people the services that they need that for parents and even for the young people themselves, it can feel really overwhelming. Um, and so I really want us to think about how can I help this family or how can I help this young person to get what they need, right, to get all the services that they need? Um, and how can I take away perhaps some of the red tape or some of the things that make it so difficult for them? And then the last thing that I want to talk about are sort of the ethics. Um, and, and I've said this sort of all the way through, but particularly with young people who are diagnosed with serious mental illness, we have to make sure that their voice and their choice is being heard. I understand that they're minors. I understand that they're young and they, they can't always make the decisions that they want. And they should always be asked, what would you like? How would this look for you? What do you want for yourself? Um, I don't like forcing young people to do anything. I think it's it goes better if we give young people their voice, their self-advocacy, their choice in, in their treatment, how they move forward, what their goals are and so forth. Um, the next one, autonomy versus dependence. Um, how do we help our young people to be individuals knowing that they're still gonna be really dependent on probably mom and dad for a long time, uh, depending on how quickly we're able to intervene with them. So how do we help to build autonomy how do we help to build those skills while understanding that we are working with young people who do rely on mom and dad um, very often, or dad and dad or mom and mom or whomever the caregiver is, um, you know, they rely on them a great deal for what they need. Um, I always involve the family, even when they don't want to be involved. I've worked with many a family that has said, no, no, we're fine. We just need you to fix our kid. And the answer to that is that's not how this works right? Um, whenever you have someone in the family who has a medical issue, do you say, we'll fix them and, you know, bring them back when you're done? No, right? That's not how that happens. So we, we really involve the family. We talk to the family. We give support to the family and all the things that they need. Uh, confidentiality is a really touchy subject, particularly, particularly when working with adolescents in individual therapy, because parents are going to say to you, I, what did they say? I want to know everything that they've said. Well, once that happens, that young person loses their sense of privacy and likely will not participate very well in the rest of the individual therapy. So I often talk to parents about, I understand that you have a right to these things. I'm not telling you you don't have a right. And is there a way that we can do this or not do this? Because I really want your your, your child to to get what they need. Uh, out of individual service, out of individual services. So, 
Uh, we need to build trust while maintaining safety. And that means being honest with our young people, right? If you tell me that you're going to harm yourself, I have to let somebody know. I am going to let somebody know. I have had many a young person say to me, can you keep a secret? And my answer is no. I'm terrible at it. I'm horrible at it. I can keep no secrets. Because the moment you keep a secret and then you have to break that secret is the moment you've lost your therapeutic alliance. Um, so be honest with young people. Tell them the truth. Make sure your communication is open, honest, transparent, both with young people and their families. Um, and make sure, and I've talked about this, that when you're diagnosing someone with a serious mental illness, you're doing it after significant assessment. Not a day, not 10 minutes, not I read the paperwork, but your own assessment to make sure that what you are diagnosing, what you are seeing, um, what you're about to put on this young person's um, record, so to speak, is accurate and something that can be helpful to them as they move forward in life. Okay, here we go. Cassie, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second. I think that's a good plan. So this is a good opportunity for anyone that has questions to use your raised hand feature um, or to ask questions in the chat. So Tara can answer your questions. We have about 13 minutes. So does anyone have any questions for Tara? And you already have your first hand, Tara. All right, Jessica, go ahead. <laughs> Hi. Um... So a couple of things you said stood out where you were saying, like, if you see symptoms at 14, address those symptoms at 14 instead of waiting until they're adults. Um, I have my like personal background is in um, speech therapy. And so, you know, like there's a lot of resources there. As soon as you start to see any kind of minor problems, you can instantly be connected with tons of resources. But I feel like you know, recently I was trying to get therapy for my own daughter. I have good health insurance. I live in a metropolitan area and I called eight different offices before I found someone who was like available. So how are families supposed to like jump that gap of like, yeah, we recognize that there's a problem, but there's no resources that are accessible. Yeah. And that's part of that systemic problem that I looked at on my, on on sort of this one of the slides at the end. There are some places are full of resources, right? You can go places and you can find a therapist and you can find support groups and you can find things. And then other places, there's nothing. Um, I don't have a fantastic answer to that, except to say, don't give up. Um, continue to look for those resources, continue to help people. What I have found is um, particularly for folks um, who either have like private insurance, like, you know, Cigna or Anthem or those kinds of things, or even folks on Medicaid, call your insurance company and say, I need this. This is what I'm looking for. This is what I need. Um, a lot of them have behavioral health case managers who will help you find what you need. And so I would sit, start there. So, you know, that would be my first suggestion is to start there. I'm not saying it's going to be unicorns and rainbows, but it still might be a place to begin, a place to start um, to get some services. It's a good question. Thank Cynthia. You. Hi, question. Um, so how do we encourage youth or adolescents to uh, basically like be susceptible to taking medication um, because of the stigma regarding like medication usage and things in that nature, would it be appropriate to say like, even I have used medication for anxiety or um, whatever the case may be, or, you know, I know someone who takes depression medicine or um, would that be appropriate or how do, like, what advice would you give a youth to kind of get them to take medication? Sure. Um, so I, my answer is going to come from a place of I do very little self-disclosure in my therapy work. Um, part of that is the population that I work with, but um, I'm not, uh, I wouldn't say to say, oh, I've used it before and it's been helpful. I probably wouldn't go down that road, but the road I would go down is let me tell you about the medication. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about some side effects. Let's talk about the good things it could do for you. Let's talk about the things you might not like. 
let's talk about how you take your medication and nobody has to know about it, right? Your friends don't have to know that you take medication. Um, your other family members outside of like your immediate family don't need to know that you take medication. Um, so I think it's an ongoing conversation. Um, my stance is I'm not going to ever force a kid to take a medication. I don't think that's um, reasonable, but I keep having the conversation. I keep talking about it. And often what I find um, is I'll say to the young person, why don't we try it? If you hate it, then we won't take it anymore, but let's try it. I need you to commit to 30 days or whatever the time frame is. Um, and let's each day journal or talk about how this is going um, so that we, we are able to uh, maybe get you on a good path of taking medication. So in your experience or in your opinion, uh, disclosing certain medication usage or uh, maybe that that might be too much in detail because I have heard therapists should use personal use of self and things in that nature, but that might be too personal. I think that might be too, for, for me, for me, that is too personal. Um, the use of self should always be done if it's going to benefit your client in some real tangible way. Um, and, you know, you could tell your client that you're on a medication and they could instantly be like, well, then you can't help me because if you're on a medication, mm. you're as bad as I am. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so that could that could work really well or it could go really bad. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Tara, I just want to jump in to say that there were there's a question in the chat next and it's asking you if the youth assessment, um, if an adult assessment can be used for a youth that is age 17. No. It's not validated for a youth of that age. It has to be 18. I mean, could you use it and 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 get some information from it? Probably. Um, should you use it and include it as part of an assessment and as part of a diagnostic tool where you're going to give an assessment to a 17 year old based on a uh, assessment for an 18 year old? Probably not. I know it's a silly it's a silly line to draw, but it's only been validated for 18 and above. And you had a second question in the chat before the other hand that's raised, and that's um, you mentioned open dialogue as a therapy for adolescents in psychosis. Can you describe what this is? Um, so open dialogue is just really, I, I haven't done it. It's not something I'm well versed in, but it's more just about having conversation, listening. Um, the way that you challenge some things is very soft and gentle. It's not like a come on, girl, you know, there's no bugs in your blood system. Like you got to stop. You can't do it like that. There's a way that you do it. And it's how you do that, the context that you put it in. Um, I'll get you more information on it. Like I said, it's not one that I use very often. So I don't have um, great, great information for you. I would go to the raised hands now. Um, okay, Tara. So I think get Rachel and then Victoria. Okay. Um, thank you. So I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm actually at my school social work practicum, and it's a special program for high school students who have um, significant emotional disabilities. So I've seen a lot of the things that you talked about. Um, one thing that I've noticed, and I wonder if you have any advice how we can support these students in a school setting, is that some of our students really rely on institutions to keep them safe or um, external factors like being with their parent all the time so they don't yeah. you know, uh, cut themselves or yeah. um, you know, do drugs. Or it, I wonder how we can support them in a school environment um, because they can be very reliant on the school social workers and, and counselors. Um, and, you know, you don't want to invalidate them asking for support. But I was just wondering if you had any any advice on that. Yeah, I think part of uh, your challenge is that um, I'm going to try to say this really delicately um, for some clinicians ensuring that another person is with them or that they're relying on another person is more about their liability than it is about teaching that person independent skills. Um, so if you're finding that you've got like one or two people who are constantly coming to you or need your support or have to hold your hand, quote unquote, um, I would say bring together the team that's working with them if you can to say, how can we help this person to find a little bit of independence and a little bit of self-reliance uh, and a little bit of self-soothing so that they're more and more and more able to do these things. Um, I, I 
have worked with young people who probably spent the whole day with their school counselors because they were not able to handle being in class. And so I think it's much more of a team approach, a collaborative approach um, that includes the young person, right? That says to them, I want you to be able to go to class and not need me. I want you to never need me again. How can we begin to take really small steps to get you there? What, you know, do you need a scrunchie on your wrist? Do you need um, to wear a certain shirt every day? I, whatever it is. Um, I had a young person where we started with a scrunchie. I need to wear a scrunchie on my arm. You know, the hair thing, scrunchies are hair things. Um, I need to wear one on my arm uh, every day. And it needs to be pink. Fabulous. Let's go get some. Um, so I think it's bit by bit. I think it's in collaboration with parents, with the young person and with anyone else who's working with them to begin to slowly move them away from always needing you to only sometimes needing you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Victoria. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, one of my questions I had was regarding kind of the family's um, involvement with navigating their child's mental health. What has been your experience with getting caregivers, whether it's mom or dad? Um, sometimes it can be through social services, um, but just any caregiver who's not quite involved or it has like a negative stigma towards serious mental illness and kind of want to be as hands off as possible. Um, I currently work at the Children's Hospital of Richmond as a behavioral health case manager for the emergency room. So I tend to work with a lot of families whose children are discharging um, and are safety planned after having suicidal ideation, homicidal ideation, things like that. And one of the biggest um, hurdles that I have sometimes with working with families is the they're fine. They woke up the next day and they seem normal. So we don't need services anymore. And it's kind of almost like it's a sense of denial, I guess, yes. but yeah. I didn't know kind of how you in, um, engage families that have that experience. So I, yeah, no, it makes sense. It makes sense. Um, and I don't have, you know, a magic answer, but what I often do for families very in the very beginning is validate them. This must be really hard for you. This must be really difficult for you. I can only imagine how scary this is for you. Um, trying to connect on the emotion level, uh, offering some validation. Um, and then I often say to folks, you know, mental illness is a really funny thing, right? One day things look really bad and then, you know, you get to bed at night and the next morning things look like they're just fine. Um, and what I wanna say to you is they're not fine. It's not okay, they're not fine. Um, and one of the best ways that we can help things to settle down and to be stable is to have consistent services in place, whatever that service is, not only for, for your young person, but for you. Wouldn't it be nice to have a service provider you can rely on and count on? Wouldn't it be nice to have somebody who might be able to offer you some support as well, or some techniques or some thought to be able to help you work with your child? I'm sure you don't want to keep coming in and seeing me right? This is not where you or your child want to be. Um, so let's put something in place. Try it out for 30 days. Try it out for 60 days. See what kind of difference it might make for you. Um, don't know that it's magic, but it's a place to start. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I do have to end it now because I have to be respectful of the time. It's like we're right. gonna. It's going to be 730. So I want to thank everyone who came. We have um, another SMI presentation that's coming up in two weeks. We have a um, professor that works at NYU. His area of expertise is suicidality and psychosis. He um, is a super producer, meaning he has produced research in this area for a long time. So if you're interested in that area of serious mental illness, I really encourage you to sign up and attend that continuing ed series and um, have a good evening. Thank you all for attending. And that's our next one. That'll be in two weeks. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, Tara, you didn't mention what residential facility you work at. Uh... Oh, United Methodist Family Services. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You too.